All right, so to get us started, um, as you know, my name is Aletta Mueller, and I am uh, the research lead for the UN Consortium. Um, and it's a great pleasure today to present to you this uh, big piece of research that took all of last year to complete. Um, basically, we were looking at financial services in the United Arab Um, I'll take you today, I'll take you through uh, the assessment topic, objectives and methodology, um, before giving you a quick overview of how these mechanisms, these digital financial assistance mechanisms that we looked at, how they are currently being used, and what level of experience people currently have, and then I'll launch right in, into the most interesting bits of the research, which are, of course, the user preferences and the barriers. Uh, before wrapping up uh, with a quick analysis and conclusion. So, without further ado, um, I'd like to once again thank the Cash Working Group, uh, who we collaborated with all of last year. And the first step was, of course, the topic scoping step. Uh, we took quarters one and two of 2021 uh, to collaborate with the stakeholders in the Cash Working Group to come up with the best possible topic for this research. And they told us that they were most interested learning about the impact of digitization of cash transfers these are the web the well-being uh, of beneficiaries so we then did a quick desk review which showed that actually the health network uh, considered um, beneficiary preferences or community acceptance as they phrase it um, as one of the four preconditions and key criteria to delivering successful And of course, I want to mention that um, they only they stated that this was one of several other factors uh, that contributed to successful city. So other factors, of course, being beneficiary needs, market conditions, as well as operational conditions. Um, so once we had determined that this topic was indeed something interesting that we wanted to explore in the Ugandan response, um, we then determined that the scope would be nationwide, or at least um, insofar as where refugees are currently in Uganda, so we decided to, do, uh, to, to assess all refugee hosting districts, as you can see on the map on the right here. Our specific objectives, or our general objective rather, was of course to inform the, uh, stakeholders and key actors in the Uganda humanitarian response. But specifically, we were wanting to look at um, the current use of digital financial assistance mechanisms and financial services. You'll notice here that I'm using two different phrases, um, assistance mechanisms and financial services. For the purposes of this assessment, we made this distinction because there are some assistance uh, mechanisms that are commercially available and others are not. Um, so the assistance mechanisms that are commercially available, such as mobile money, bank transfers, and cards, um, those are also termed financial services um, that are commercially available. Anyone can access them outside of their community. Context. Uh, whereas, for example, direct OTC cash is only available as a humanitarian service mechanism or assistance mechanism. Excuse me. Um, so, after looking at the current use and the current experience levels, we also wanted to look at the barriers to access and use. And finally, of course, the heart of the matter, we wanted to assess uh, user preferences or both, both refugee and host community preferences, as well as the factors influencing. Preference. Um, our methodology uh, was mixed method. Unfortunately, we had a bit of a difficult start during uh, COVID 19 lockdown. Um, so, we started off with remote data collection and we did a couple of KIIs in each of the 17 assessment locations. Um, and those were with community leaders, um, general community leaders, as well as uh, representatives for women in PSNs. And then once the field opened back up, um, we, under strict COVID SOPs, uh, went into the field and uh, conducted the FGDs, um, so community group interviews, as well as in-depth interviews. These were particularly targeted as elderly individuals. And then we used the um, Kanua Toolkit, so it was a practical end-user tool. Um, and the Kanua Toolkit, um, I want to give credit here to GSMA, who launched the toolkit in 
in collaboration with REACH. Um, and this is a tool where that allowed us to practically assess digital literacy. So we gave, uh, we gave the beneficiaries or we gave the interviewees physically a smartphone to uh, perform certain tasks on. And then of course the backbone of this assessment were the individual surveys, of which we did over 3,400, um, which allowed for a representativeness of 95% confidence level and that is at the settlement level for refugees and the district level for post communities. Um, I want to note here that my presentation today will focus mainly on the refugees, just purely because of time. But do please feel free to ask about and do also read the full report uh, to, to understand more about the host community results as well. So we then, of course, trying our primary data with secondary data and um, one, and then once we had uh, gathered our preliminary results and then preliminary um, analysis, we went back into the field and validated our data, basically asking the interviewees again, how we miss anything, how we misinterpret anything. Uh, and I'm happy to say that that validation was very successful. So, launching right into uh, the findings, the hard matter, giving you a quick overview of how people are currently using this mechanism for refugee particularly, you can see that mobile money is used by the majority of refugees and the usage is much lower for bank transfers and prepayments than cards currently. Um, and about half of refugees report or have used to direct the OTC cash. Um, there are some better differences, particularly when it comes to um, mobile money Um, 
Now the question is how far does that uh, correlation go, right? Um, and if we direct disaggregate further here, looking at Nativare, we chose Nativare as a case study here because um, the refugees in this particular um, settlement have the longest history of using prepaid and smart cards and tax transfers. So we can see on the left that uh, mobile money remains the most preferred mechanism, most frequently report, uh, supposed to be preferred. However, as soon as we go a little bit further to the right, um, we can see that cards are now the second most preferred mechanism in that value. That's 29%. It's quite a stark difference as compared to 3% in all other uh, refugee settlements. So, we can see that although on money is still the preferred mechanism in Akhivadeh, cards have gained enormously. And the conclusion here is that experience, to an extent, can perhaps influence preferences. Now I want to give a little caveat to there, I say to an extent, because on my previous slide, um, I showed you that in the Southwest region in general, the preference for mobile money stood at 36%. Um, and when we look at Akhivadeh, it stands at 35% meaning that that, has not, that group has not significantly changed at all. So my conclusion here is that the people who are preferring, or who say the preference for cards in Nativale are migrating not from mobile money to cards, but are migrating from perhaps a preference for direct cash to a preference for cards. Um, so having looked a little bit at the preferences, we also now want to dig a little bit deeper into the factors that may influence Barriers. Um, first, I want to give you a quick overview of all of the, or sort of the, the breadth of the different types of barriers that we have uncovered. Um, do keep in mind this is not an exhaustive list. All right. So, first of all, of course, all of the mechanisms that are commercially available, i.e., mobile money, bank transfers, and cards, um, are curtailed. The use of them is curtailed by lack of income. Right. Some people say, well. Simply don't have enough money to get a bank, uh, bank account or buy a phone or a SIM card. Uh, and of course, this is not an issue for direct cash. However, there are other issues, um, digital and digital literacy as well as basic literacy issues. We'll talk a little bit more about. Also, particularly affect uh, the, three, the three first mechanisms. However, there are other inconveniences for direct and OTC cash which we mainly are having to stand in line for a long time in difficult weather conditions, perhaps even in a crowded place, which obviously, as we all know, is not ideal during a pandemic. Um, access issues in terms of uh, location, locate, accessing physically the mechanism um, is difficult for mobile money. I named them super agents, and I'm sure that they will talk a little bit more about these as well. Um, so super agents is something that perhaps agents that have um, special uh, responsibilities or abilities to uh, particularly activate lines, activate and sell SIM cards, or solve more complex complaints. Um, although the day-to-day -day issues are uh, easy to solve with mobile money, um, and the day-to-day -day access is reportedly quite easy. However, um, that issue is a bit more uh, widespread for banks and cards, um, where all agents are reportedly harder to reach in comparison to mobile money. Um, and of course, um, we can say in compared to OTC cash, it necessitates a single distribution site, which may be more or less difficult to reach for some. Um, ID issues, um, and I know Eunice mentioned this, um, are linked to the KYC requirements, know your customer requirements, and that particularly is reported linked to mobile money and bank transfers. Um, there are other complications for cards, um, respondents reportedly are confused by how to get cards, how to use cards, what are the terms and conditions, how can I register for one. Um, and finally, for direct and OTC cash, that uh, is uh, reportedly very insecure. And of course, this is a physical mechanism. Um, the date and time of distribution is publicly available. Um, the place is publicly available, and sometimes even uh, the amount of money that's being distributed. For mobile money, finally, um, a lack of phones, I think that's pretty straightforward. And um, then bank transfers are perceived to be the most expensive mechanism to use from a beneficiary point of view. They have to travel to the agent, 
uh, to take out money until in order to activate the account. They may even have to pay taxes, usage fees, maintenance fees, account opening fees. Um, so, but looking a little bit deeper into one particular barrier, which is the literacy as promised, um, we looked at three different types of literacy. The basic literacy, of course, being the ability to read and write. And here, I have to note that in order to be considered literate for this research, you have to be able to read and write. So if you can only do one or the other, this person must still seem to be illiterate. Digital literacy is the ability to find, evaluate, and communicate information using basically electronic devices, such as a laptop, a phone, um, tablet, and so forth. Financial literacy is the ability to understand basic principles of business and finance. And the second two are digital literacy and financial literacy, or compound indicators, which are a bit difficult to measure because they are compound indicators. And I'll get a little bit, um, I'll explain a little bit more when I get to them. But basically, that means we ask several different questions and then have to sort of and analyze all of these questions together to come um, to a single measurement. Um, so the graph on the right here, basic literacy amongst refugees, um, is in my mind shockingly low. Only 31% of refugees were reported to be fully literate or basically literate, meaning that over two thirds of refugees are not able, fully, are not able um, to do basic reading and writing tasks. And of course, if we have that in mind for some of the mechanisms that we're trying to promote here, that's a huge issue, right? Um, in contrast, looking at financial literacy on the left here, um, a lot of refugees reported that they are able to make a plan to avoid building up too much debt. Um, actually, 77% reported that they're able to avoid building up too much debt. Um, and that is similar for the host community. And that is, so this is one of the questions that we ask for the compound indicator of financial literacy. And several of the other, or most of the other questions where we ask about financial literacy also turned out to be quite high. And the same goes for numeracy. When we ask, can you count, can you subtract, can you divide? Most of refugees reported that yes, I can do these tasks. So numeracy and financial literacy are um, in comparatively to basic and digital literacy, we'll see quite high amongst the refugee population. But as I said, digital literacy, now coming to that, the proportion of refugees by digital skill they are able to perform, and here we can see some several of the indicators that we asked about making and receiving calls, topping up airtime, sending and receiving text messages. So basically, I've ordered them or tried to order them. Um, from sort of most simple task to more difficult, um, combining several different uh, literacy types together. So making and receiving calls, which perhaps only requires basic numeracy, that was able to, most refugees were able to perform this task. But as soon as we get to sending and receiving a text message, where of course basic, uh, basic literacy um, is required, that already drops to 55%. And then further, when we add in digital literacy skills, such as using social media and sending an email. Um, and this, again, is concerning, especially when we also factor in the low proportion of respondents that reported ever having received training in these areas. Um, only about a third having received financial literacy training, and much less even having received digital literacy training. So again, if we, if we keep in mind what we're trying to achieve here, trying to promote um, digital tools and digital financial uh, assistance mechanisms, and that's concerning, right? So, um, as I'm running out of time, I don't want to go over, <laughs> so I'll um, give you a quick overview of um, my analysis, and please go to the report um, to, to further elaborate on that. Um, basically, we concluded that mobile money is the overall preference because it is compared to the team and easy to access. Um, <laughs> it is secure uh, due to privacy, especially in comparison to uh, direct and OCC cash. Um, it is already in commercial use, uh, so people are already used to this mechanism, and that is also partially why it is used by even illiterate individuals. Um, however, as we have identified, agents that can solve complex issues and set up accounts that, uh, that those individuals can be hard to reach. Um, 
In comparison, bank transfers and prepaid and smart cards um, are not yet as popular because they are unfamiliar to most users. Um, and in addition, they are comparatively expensive, also due to long distances that individuals must travel. Um, they are difficult to use for illiterate individuals. They have difficult to access feedback and complaints mechanisms. But um, the one key factor, particularly in the bank account, is that if you have a lot of money to store, they are considered to be the most secure. Secure, sorry. <laughs> and finally, direct to OTC cash is easy, uh, easy to access for most individuals, particularly also for illiterate individuals. It is, however, it is very insecure. Um, but again, on the flip side, that means that feedback and complaints mechanisms are very easy to access. So finally, I want to once again remind you that this is a very summarized, um, yeah, a very uh, short summary of the findings. So please do read this full report if you can. Um, but these findings must be seen in context. So yeah, do read the report, read the background section. Um, user preferences are one of four preconditions that are identified by help for successful CPA. Uh, so there are other factors, of course, for implementers to take into account. And finally, an activity case study shows that experience can influence user preference, preferences to an extent. So with that, I want to close out. Thank you for your attention. I want to remind you again to use the question cards, please. Um, I'd be happy to receive your questions at the end of today's presentation during our Q&A. And, okay. and I'll hand over to Malaga. Thank you for your attention.